bright and early on Monday morning. Um, my name is Carl Shriver, and um, what I'm going to do today is talk to you about the solar atmosphere. <clears throat> That's a pretty big topic to cover in just an hour and a half, so I'm going to basically give you um, an introduction to the properties of the solar atmosphere, what makes a stellar atmosphere in, in general and a solar atmosphere in particular. Uh, I'll go through some of the terminology that we use, some of the physical properties, but it's all on an introductory level, hoping to give you a mapping to the various chapters that we've already provided in the heliophysics textbook series. Now, I'm going to do this in two parts. Uh, one part is about the general structure and, and the dynamics of the solar atmosphere in what we call quiescence, as in not subject to a major eruption or a major flare. And the second part, I'll, I'll show you examples of what flares and coronal mass ejections are about uh, near the sun, because I'll stick within the solar atmosphere. Um, and what I'll try and do is, is have a question and answer period after each one of these two parts. So I'll break in the middle. If there are questions that you'd like to ask while I'm talking, because I'm completely forgetting to explain my jargon, for example, then please raise your hand and, and by all means interrupt, OK? The solar atmosphere uh, sort of starts at the surface. And many people would argue that, of course, the sun does not have a surface because it's a cloud of gas. Uh, so in many definitions, the atmosphere actually includes the surface layers that we're used to seeing in visible light. In order to see anything else outside of eclipses, you have to shift your wavelengths around, either tune to particular wavelengths, uh, narrow bands in the visible, or you have to go off in the wavelength domain, either to the radio or what I'll be focused on, on mostly, towards the ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, and X-ray domains. And by the time you start looking at those parts of the solar atmosphere, they, of course, look very different. Suddenly, you see features that you won't see if you just look at the sun with appropriate filters in visible light. And you're beginning to see the structures that are dominated by the magnetic field. And stepping through this in temperature, Going up, uh, you get to this domain that we call the chromosphere. I'll, sh I'll describe to you in more detail what it really means and what the definitions are. That's still pretty close to the surface. And in fact, this particular domain is most of what Phil Judge will be talking about when he talks about the solar photosphere, the uh, chromosphere. Going higher up, <clears throat> you shift through different temperature domains by looking at different ionization stages of um, primarily iron. Iron is the primary radiative loss term from the solar corona. So we're always looking at iron lines or clusters of iron lines to do this. And you go to different temperatures, and you see a slightly different structure. Now, in all that structure, there are lots of objects that have names. And I have to be frank about this, that there are many terms that solar physicists will use that to another solar physicist don't quite mean the same thing. So you have to always ask yourself, what exactly did you mean by that term? I'm going to go through a few of them. Um, <clears throat> in here, there's something that we call an active region. And an active region, typically, by uh, the formal definition is it should have had a spot at some point in its life. Otherwise, we just should not be calling it an active region. And above an active region is a brightening in the corona, like indicated here. Now, active regions come in a variety of scales. I'll come back to the range of scales in just a moment. And they go all the way to really small ones. that are sort of just the b tiny brightenings in the corona that still have a magnetic bipole underneath them. So there's really nothing that differentiates them from an active region other than that they have not had a spot or any darkening structure uh, in the photosphere underneath them. And then it gets even more confusing when we talk about quiet sun. Quiet sun, to me, means anything that isn't active in an active region. Um, some people will say quiet sun means the very quietest areas that you can find. And there's a big range, as I will show you in those two different definitions. Now, not everything that's a slight brightening in here is an ephemeral region. Because an ephemeral region means there's a little bipole that came up under the surface and somehow heated the, the atmosphere above it. But really, what it takes is only two opposite polarities to come together to form a brightening in the corona. So there's a, there's a general definition of things that are called X-ray bright points or EUV bright points, depending on whether you're looking at them in X-rays or EUV. What they need is two polarities underneath them. So you can create a loop system above them 
but they either came up together, in which case you call them an ephemeral region, or they collided, in which case we don't have a differentiating term for them. They're just called a bright point. And they're called point because for the longest time, people didn't have the resolution to see what they were. Now that we do, they just look like an active region, strands of loops like this with their own complexity and dynamics, except very much smaller. And then on top of this, there are these things called coronal holes. Now, coronal hole, again, uh, the formal definition is it's dark in x-rays. Many people nowadays will use coronal holes as almost equivalent to the statement that's where the field is open to the heliosphere. The plasma is not confined. It streams out. These are not domains that are cold. These are domains that don't have much gas in them. So they still emit at the same wavelengths, just very little because there isn't enough material to give you a bright emission. So all of these things together make this pattern of the solar outer atmosphere. And depending on, as I said, you go to different temperatures from one to another, you'll find different imagery. All of that brightness, all of that structure that's formed in the outer atmosphere of the sun is, being gener is associated with magnetic fields that thread the surface, that come from inside the sun and go out. So we can make overlays of the magnetic field blend in the different polarities here that isn't all that clear. But if I take away now the emission, you'll see that there's lots of structures here uh, from large structures that are essentially a sunspot here uh, in the photosphere, bipolar patches that are diffusing. This is another term that I'll have to define. Uh, in solar physics, you'll often hear the term that once an active region comes to the surface, it begins to dis diffuse across the surface. Now, that's not diffusion in the formal physical sense of in having a high resistivity where the field is decaying because there's a resistivity. For that, this, the length scales are too large. What really happens is that things are caught in the convective motions and it disperses in a random walk across the surface, which is really equivalent to a diffusion process, except it's not the plasma physical diffusion term. So when we describe it by a diffusion coefficient, don't think that the resistivity is high. It's the dynamics of the, of the field being caught in in the motions. And I'll get to movies so you can see the dynamics of all of this in just a moment. On top of that is magnetic field. We're having a very difficult time modeling that magnetic field because we don't understand the, the, the forces, the dynamics, the energy input, or the wave pressure terms um, that are acting on this field. So if you go to sites like this, which I'll just put in an advertisement, this is where you can see it says sun today because you can actually get to sun today, but you can also go back for the last two years that the Solar Dynamics Observatory has been observing the sun, which is what most of these images are coming from. We're also comparing the solar corona with a potential field. That doesn't mean that the potential field is a very good approximation all the time, and I'll, I'll get to where we use it for and what it's useful for in just a moment. Now, I would imagine, how, how many here have been trained in stellar evolution? All right, that's uh, not a very big fraction. <laughs> but it's nice to see some of you still are. The sun is a star. And I'll start with the internal structure of the sun, because I, I want to make you aware of the fact that there are many other suns out there from which we can also get information. The, the interior structure of the sun is such that the inner 70% of it is basically not moving. Um, the energy being liberated in the nuclear fusion reactors in the very core of the, of the star escapes by photons being scattered through that medium. Once you get to the outer 30, 29 percent, um, you're actually in a domain that's a convection zone. It becomes stratified in such a way that if you give a parcel of gas a, um, a perturbation, it continues in that perturbation. It's convectively unstable. This has to do with the, the way that opacities change, but I'm not going to get into that. It is that convective motion coupled with the rotation of the star that drives the dynamo. And the dynamo generates all these magnetic phenomena that I'll be talking about for the remaining hour and 15 minutes or so in the solar atmosphere. There isn't terribly much mass in it. It's only 2% of the total mass. But it's a big part of the volume. And it's the part where all of the interesting phenomena occur that drive whatever happens in the solar atmosphere and the heliosphere and the surroundings of the planets that go through, go through their orbits around the sun. 
Now, if we look at a, this, so this is the basic internal structure. It has a convection zone. If you make a diagram, which stellar astro astronomers call a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, where you basically compare the brightness of the star with the temperature at the surface, um, there's this band here where stars spend most of their adult life. That's called the main sequence. The sun sits sort of in the geometric average of it. It's a fairly bright, but not really big star, which is good because if it had been a lot brighter, its lifetime would not have been very long, and then we wouldn't be here probably. The, the, there's one common factor to all of the stars that are on this right-hand side of the diagram, and those are the stars that are cool in relative terms. So those are the, the white stars, like the sun, the yellow, the orange, and the red stars, uh, or in spectral types from about late F all the way into the coolest M-type stars and now beyond. Now that we have more sensitivity, we can see that there are stars actually off this tail end of the, di of, of the diagram. All of those stars have a, conv a convective envelope under their surface. So all of those stars do essentially what the sun does. They generate some form of magnetism that is very dynamic in, in the sense that it changes on time scales very much shorter than the time scale that have to, anything to do with the evolution of the star. It's years rather than millions to billions of years that the field is changing. So if you look through the literature, you need to find what's called the cool stars. The cool stars are the sun-like stars in that sense. Um, and if you look at, <laughs> this is another representation of that, that Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the luminosity versus temperature diagram with the sun on an evolutionary track where it was on the main sequence, it's getting slightly brighter, and then at some point it's going to run out of fuel and get brighter a lot. It's also going to get bigger a lot. Um, what it does in practical terms for us here, living here on Earth is, of course, uh, mostly you're interested in, well, what is the luminosity? What's the light output of the sun? And if you look at that versus age, you can see that really over most of the lifetime from the point that it became a mature star, four and a half billion years ago to now, it hasn't brightened by very much, by some 10 to maybe 15%. And I've put two time markers on here. These are the points where first single-celled life supposedly emerged and where multi-celled life emerged, and then us are sort of really well within the, even the size of that sun. So the solar brightness overall has not changed by very much over billions of years. What has changed is the brightness that has, any, has something to do with the activity of the sun. So when you look at the extreme ultraviolet or the x-rays, the sun has changed in brightness tremendously. Now, I've used terms photosphere, chromosphere, transition region, corona, and heliosphere. Um, and I thought I should go through, s just touch on the various definitions that you'll find uh, in the literature. Formally, the way I was trained as a stellar astrophysicist, uh, most of these definitions have something to do in, with the way that radiation escapes from these uh, domains. So the photosphere really is the transition where you go from something that's completely optically thick in almost all wavelengths to almost entirely optically thin above it in almost all wavelengths. Uh, that's a layer that's something like 100 kilometers thick. And and that's why we're not calling it a real surface, because it has a substantial extent. Um, when we talk about the chromosphere, the chromosphere is essentially a layer that is optically thin to almost everything, except if you look at specific strong lines in some of the low ionized states. By the time you get into the corona, it's essentially transparent, except if you go to radio waves. But from all the way from x-rays down to the infrared, it's a transparent layer. Now, that's not really the definition that's commonly used. More commonly, you'll find a definition nowadays, terminology that's based on temperature domains. So often you'll, you'll hear that the chromosphere is the domain that has something to do with 10 to 20,000 Kelvin, more or less. The corona is the domain that we'll call anything that is over about a million degrees. And roughly, these, these definitions are um, corresponding to each other, but not quite. So you have to think about exactly how you define these terms. Another way of thinking about them is, well, what happens in these domains? So you can think about how energy comes in and goes out. Well, in the photosphere, the energy comes in by being advected in the convective flows from beneath. Once it reaches that transparency point, matter cools very effectively by radiation going out into infinity, and the plasma Come, cools and falls down again. So the energy in and energy out is really advection in and radiation out. 
Um, if I make a leap for a moment to the corona, the corona uh, is, heated, is heated by um, electromagnetic energy, electrical currents, wave patterns in the field coming in, being dissipated into thermal energy. And energy can leave the corona in, essentially in two ways. Um, it can be radiated, but it can also be conducted away. And much of that conducted energy comes down at the top end of the, of this, the, the low solar atmosphere, where it forms the transition region. So the transition region really is a, is a weird domain, um, it, which is heated primarily by, matter com by energy coming down from above, by material coming down from below, and all sorts of phenomena in between. The chromosphere is where Phil will be talking about later. Um, it's also radiated, uh, non-radiatively heated. It is hotter than the surface, so it needs some other form of energy coming in that has something to do with magnetic fields. There's a little bit of wave, real purely acoustic heating probably in the background, but it's relatively unimportant. Most of the dynamics of this thing has to do with the field. And when you talk about the field, of course, you're talking about a big range in uh, parameters where you go in the photosphere. It's essentially dominated by advection uh, of the plasma. The plasma is just convecting and ignores the magnetic field, except when the field is so strong that it forms things like large sunspots, where it can actually obstruct the convective motions. Um, the corona is almost entirely dominated by the magnetic field. The plasma is tied to it. It moves with whatever the coronal magnetic field wants to do. The chromosphere, Phil's domain, is the tough one. It's the one where pretty much every assumption we make fails. It's not entirely optically thin. Um, it, is, it, it spans, it straddles this domain from a fairly high to a fairly low plasma beta. Um, so it, it is partially ionized, in which probably we need to start thinking about multi-fluids rather than a single fluid MHD. So I'll leave that for the next lecture. Now, if you go to one of the figures in volume one, you can, you can have a look at what really these things mean in terms of a temperature versus density diagram. And the point I'd like to make here is we essentially live in that little green box here. Well, actually, on only one end of the green box uh, in terms of temperatures and densities. We live at very low temperatures and very high densities. Uh, most of the solar atmosphere is, is nothing. It's vacuum. It's a higher vacuum than what we call, uh, than you would find, for instance, at the space shuttle orbit. You know, there's, there's little there. I think that's all I want to say about the figure. You should have a look at it and, and compare it um, to see where the domains in the solar atmosphere map to other domains that we are used to thinking of in, in the heliophysics domain. And you'll find there isn't terribly much overlap. So that's why we're all working in these different boxes and have our separate uh, domains of expertise. Um, the solar corona is dominated by the magnetic field, as I said. But that doesn't mean that the solar magnetic field dominates everywhere. If we look at an active region where the field is strong, it's 100 to 1,000 Gauss over the areas that somewhere have a sunspot within them, you'll find that you are in a, uh, in a domain here where the, where the field dominates the plasma from some thousands of kilometers up to some 100,000 kilometers up. But below it and above it, you're again in the domain where the plasma motions can actually dominate the field motions. And the same is true, as, as you can see, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip that in the quiet sun domain. The quiet sun corona actually is, for most of it, really in not too far from being dominated by, sorry, it's dominated by the field, but not by an awful lot. So what do these structures do? Well, here are some of the structures that I was talking about. Once you put enough magnetic field in the solar surface, you create structures that we call sunspots, like this. Uh, which is typically the size of the Earth, or a couple of times the size of the Earth, which have to them what we call an umbra and a penumbra, literally a shadow and a half shadow. Uh, and, the, and both of those are completely dominated by the magnetic field. And here in the penumbra, you can see the striations that are formed by this magnetic field. If you look at smaller and smaller amounts of flux threading the solar photosphere, the field doesn't get much weaker. Field strength is set by a balance between gas and field uh, pressure. It always is around a kilogauss or two kilogauss. 
but if you put less and less flux in, at some point what happens is that that penumbra disappears and you get structures like this, which really are, they're called pores. They have very little of a penumbra around them. If you go and make them even smaller than that, you get to other structures uh, of which you can see these tiny little points that are everywhere between these granular cells. By the way, any one of these granular cells is sort of the size of Texas or Germany um, or Botswana. You have to, you know, I guess with your nationalities, we have to think around the world for a bit. It's a sizable country. It's about 1,000 to 1,500 kilometers in diameter, each one of these cells. So you can guess how big that thing is. And if you look through uh, this table, uh, you can get an idea of how much flux is involved. If you, we express our fluxes in Maxwell's. So we go from some 10 to the, a couple of times 10 to the 22 Maxwell's to make a sunspot to just 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 19 Maxwell's, 1,000 to 10,000 times less to make these other structures. And these structures are either dark or bright. And what happens is this, very briefly. If the field is very strong, it's going to impede convective energy transport. The cooling at the surface continues. If, if you impede the amount of energy coming from below, but still are radiating at the top, you're going to just cool down this plasma. It's going to cool down and become effectively dark. If the spot is large enough that its horizontal extent is larger than the mean free path of the photons, you can't radiate into it from the side even. So they stay dark. But as you go towards smaller and smaller structures, you get the amount of energy that still leaks in from the sides gets bigger in relative terms compared to what's leaking out from the top. So at some point, the two are going to balance. That's what we call a magnetic knot. This is something that doesn't show up in a white light image at all. It's, it's where uh, the amount of energy coming in and the amount of energy from the sides and the amount of energy lacking from the bottom sort of balance. And as you go towards even smaller ones, the smallest structures actually become bright because now the amount of energy that's missing from that little tiny concentration from the bottom is not that big. And the amount of energy coming in from the side dominates. So you get a leak. You have actually a leak in the photosphere. That's why you have bright, what we call faculae, that are very small but very abundant, and dark sunspots. And if you're interested in trying to understand the total solar irradiance, for example, uh, variations because you're interested in coupling into climate, you have to know both of these uh, parts, components, dark configurations and bright configurations in order to be able to model your way through and understand why the solar total solar irradiance varies the way that it does. Now all of this varies in time. So I'm going to show you just a month in, this, in the life of the sun here. This is May that just ended uh, where you can see these spots. You can see them evolve on a time scale of a couple of days. So spots, even the largest spots don't live for longer than a few weeks. Now, there's a few things you can see just here. Just as you look at the edge, you see these slight brightenings. Those are the faculae, the small magnetic concentrations that you see best at the sides and that are rather difficult to see once you get them on disk, just because of the way that the, the radiative transfer uh, is working. But they're there. And of course, once you start looking in them in a magnetogram, it, it is much more obvious. You can see the large concentrations here, the active regions with lots of bubbling and motions going on. And you can see what's out here that we call all that quiet sun is continually changing because all these concentrations of magnetic flux are being pushed around in the convective motions. And very frequently, in fact, they run into an opposite polarity and they'll just cancel from the photosphere, uh, probably mostly because they're being retracted back into the sun at that point. So although a pa these pa long patterns of the, these fairly single polarity patches that you see here are just residues of active regions falling apart with one polarity going one way and another polarity slightly going the other way. They really diffuse into each other. But there's always a dominant pattern that eventually forms depending on all the successive generations of all the previous active regions that came up. So this is still quiet sun, but it's enhanced network. Now, all of these concentrations, sometimes you'll hear people talk about the, the, the fact that the polar caps, for example, are formed because of the preferential diffusion and drift of these magnetic fields to the, to the high latitudes, and they are. But each individual concentration doing this doesn't lift for more than a day or two or three before it collides with something else, and it's replaced by another one that then comes up in an ephemeral region. So what survives is the pattern, the imbalance in the flux, not the individual structure.
That's an important thing to remember. Above that, uh, sorry, that scale range goes all the way from large active regions to this dynamic car carpet. And if you look at the clock here, it's a fairly fast running clock. But it just shows you just how dynamic the smallest of these scales are. And all of these scale ranges from the very smallest that we can observe, which nowadays range to about 100 kilometers, to the very largest, which are almost spanning the whole sun after they diffuse and uh, spread their patterns across the sun, um, are dynamic and generated by what we call the dynamo process underneath the atmosphere. Um, I'm going to skip this bit and then start moving into the atmosphere. Now, when you start looking at the hard part, where the photons don't escape uh, immediately, so you look at the chromosphere, um, you can actually see an enormous amount of complexity and dynamics. So if you look at how this moves, this is magnetically dominated plasma that you see in a line that is emitted by this, the most common element on the sun, hydrogen. Um, compare that to the Earth for scale. Uh, so there's lots of fine structure, tenths of arc seconds, and probably a lot smaller, but we can't see those yet, uh, changing on time scales of just minutes as waves pass through, as the magnetic field changes shape. And I think Phil will explain all of this this afternoon. No, this is really a complicated domain. I just want to make you aware of the fact that the sun, with its 1 in 1.4 million 1.4 million kilometer diameter has scales that go all the way down to the very smallest scale that we can see. And the smaller the scale, the more dynamic things tend to become. And you can, of course, access much of that dynamics by looking at different wavelengths. And as you scan through a very narrow part of a spectral line, you can already see that the transparency shifts enormously. And you seem to see different, you see different structures at different heights. The complexity of looking at the solar atmosphere is that we're always somehow looking through a lot of these layers at the same time, and yet we have to try and figure out what it is that we're looking at and what it is telling us. Now, I'm going to go to this part of the atmosphere, the dynamic atmosphere, the, the, the outer part of the sun. I would recommend if you go to that website, um, you can find movies for every day. You can find them summarized for months. Um, and you can see them in different wavelengths and get an idea of what happens in the solar corona. If you look at these, there's, there is no quiet day. No structure in the solar atmosphere lives for very long. Just look at any one of them, and you can see them change. You can see changes inside coronal holes. You can see changes, explosions in active regions um, all over the place. All of that is driven by the magnetic cycle. So somewhere in the deep interior, uh, spots are being formed. These spots come and go, uh, and they form patterns that shift over time uh, from mid-latitudes to lower latitudes that shift, that change from cycle to cycle. No cycle repeats exactly as the previous cycle um, happened. And all of that, as I said, contributes to, if you wish to understand the total solar irradiance or the solar spectral irradiance, you have to figure out what happens from the very smallest to the very largest of scales. Now, just to give you a feel for what happens if you look at other stars, one thing you can do is say, let me compare the brightness of the solar corona with the brightness of the solar chromosphere, just energy coming out at 10,000 Kelvin and energy coming out at a few million Kelvin. And if you do that in a diagram like this, you'll find that the sun sits sort of there. And then there are all these other dots. Well, it turns out that if you look at other stars like the sun and look at how much energy comes out of their coronae and comes out of their chromospheres, and you put them in a diagram like this, they all line up. And this is one, two, three, four. That's a factor of 100,000 in the specific surface brightness. So this is, this is scaling out the radius of the star. Because at any point, any area of a given size on the stellar surface, you can have a range of over a factor of 100,000 in coronal brightness. And there's still a substantial range of about a factor of 1,000 in the chromospheric brightness. And in fact, they all have to do something with how much magnetic field threats the surface. We still don't really know how, what this diagram is telling us. But I'll tell, you what it, I'll tell you my interpretation of at least the beginning of it. The stars in that particular diagram looked like this. They basically contain giant stars, like that one, uh, 
or the sun, which is here, or the resolution of this gleam is insufficient to show you the smaller ones. You go down to a, a, a third of a solar radius at least, maybe even smaller than that. They all line up here. In fact, some stars are in binary systems, where one star orbits another, sometimes so close together that they actually form a common envelope star, like that one. Or they spin so rapidly that they're not really spheres anymore. They become oblate. And yet they all lie on that diagram. To me, this means that the atmosphere doesn't really care about what star it's on. Once you put a magnetic field through the surface, it will find a way to redistribute, to put, deposit energy and redistribute energy in a way that it always follows a diagram like this. And this is only comparing X-rays and chromospheric emission, but you can compare X-rays with anything here. And this is basically a map of how steep that slope is versus the temperature of the line formation. And you can see that there's the, 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 uh, the corona responds most strongly to uh, input from a magnetic field and the chromosphere least strongly, but there's a very nice relationship between the formation temperature that you're looking at and how much energy comes out in the stellar atmosphere. Um, I'm going to skip this bit, apart from the fact that I can tell you that we do have a pretty good idea of what the sun has looked like in time. That most of us are familiar with the sun sort of like this, um, which still has sunspots. We do know that the sun is losing angular momentum fairly efficiently. It's flowing out through the solar wind and extracting angular momentum and slowing the sun down. That's the main change over the life of the main sequence, not, not the internal structure, the spin rate. And with the spin rate from a very young star, a young sun which had enormous star spots, which could cover up to about half of a hemisphere, down to the present day sun, took, a, took only about 100 million years to lose most of its activity. Right now it's here, another four and a half billion years from now it won't have much activity, no sunspots anymore all petered out, and then it'll start growing into a giant, which is going to be a fairly boring one from the perspective of activity. But we don't have to worry about that because we won't be here anymore. <coughs> because by then, the Earth will have been gobbled up or at least melted in the brightness of that growing sun. But that's four and a half billion years in the future. Um, and if you wanted to know more about the timelines of these things and what it means for the habitability of the planet, pardon me, look at... Um, look at volume three, chapters two, three, and four, which combines all these things. So, Brief interruption. Any questions on this part? All right. I'll, I'll keep going. Yes, go ahead. Because I, sk I skipped one, uh, I skipped one thing. The question is why? Why do you, the faculae actually show up as bright as you make them smaller? Because even though you radiate more energy in, why don't they ob obtain the same brightness as the rest of the photosphere? I skipped one step. This is an important step. As you cool material, um, it becomes denser. And that means that where the position of where the surface of the sun lies, from where the radiation actually escapes, is a little below where it is in the surrounding uh, layers. So if you look at sunspots, for example, as they rotate towards the edge of the sun, you can see that the, the deep interior, that the, inter the darkest interior is in fact a little lower. You can see the geometric distortion. I think it's of the order of 200 kilometers for a sunspot. For faculae, it's a little less than that. But it means that the surface of the sun actually looks like this going through uh, a, a, a magnetic concentration. So when I say radiation comes in from the side, what you're actually seeing is the hot side walls. And that also explains why, as you look at it from at the side of the sun, uh, as it rotates over onto the disk or rotates off, they actually show up a little better, because you're looking even more directly onto these hotter sides that are slightly below the surrounding surface. And because they're slightly below, they're actually a little hotter than the surface elsewhere. So that's why. OK. Now, 
even though I showed you all these changes in the solar atmosphere already, these are not the most energetic of changes. Uh, at some point, uh, there's energy available to erupt and explode, to drive all the things that we call eventually space weather. That energy has to come from somewhere. And one Im immediate clue that you can get is by comparing an image of the solar corona with a potential field extrapolation. And what you'll see is that in some cases, these potential field extrapolations trace the shapes of these magnetic loops that glow in the atmosphere above them pretty well. In many cases, however, it does a remarkably poorly job, remarkably poor job, like here. These structures, these emitting structures, seem to have nothing to do with the potential field. And that, of course, is telling you that there's something else than just a potential field that sits over the magnetic foot points. There are, elect there are electrical currents running through the, uh, the corona. These distort the field from their potential state. And they could carry enough energy to actually drive explosions. You can just see it. If we did a visual inspection of a lot of these regions, and wherever you see a substantial change, you're basically looking at um, regions that are much more likely to flare and much more likely to flare more brightly. So where is that energy? Well, that's one of the puzzles that we're still struggling with. Um, the way to measure the, the energy that's associated with electrical currents running through coronal active regions uh, rests on the fact that we have to be able to make an extrapolation of the field that we can only measure near the surface. One way to extrapolate that is to, for example, say, let's assume that there are no other forces acting on the field than the forces of the field and the electrical currents in, within them themselves. That typically is called a nonlinear force-free approximation. So it's, a, it's simplified already from MHD, but MHD requires us to put in knowledge that we really don't have. So let's start with the simplest thing that we can just get away with, the nonlinear force-free field approximation. If you do that, for this particular region we applied it, we could actually show that this is where the strong electrical currents run before the flare and after the flare, much of that electrical current system has disappeared. So this was a nice application. The difficulty with it is that we're still um, developing this method because there's one major shortcoming of it. It assumes that the field is force-free, that there are no other forces acting on the field. And this is true just about everywhere except during the explosion itself, just about everywhere in the solar corona. But it is not true where we measure the field. We measure the field at the surface, and at the surface, the motion of the plasma are strong enough to distort the field. So it isn't force-free there. Well, why don't you measure it somewhere else? Well, measuring it somewhere else actually turns out to be really, really, really difficult. Um, we're trying to get up at least into the chromosphere, but even in the chromosphere, you're not entirely force-free. So we're still struggling with a way to map our way through this particular problem, that we have to find a way to extrapolate a field in order to measure the energy, but we know that we're using the wrong boundary condition. It's an ongoing research topic. Yes, sir? That's the basic assumption that underlies it all, that there are no pressure gradient forces and that there are no plasma dynamic forces acting. Uh, so that, indeed, the currents always run in, pa run in parallel to the magnetic field. So that the, the magnetic field lines actually show you the, the, the paths of the currents. That is true in most of the corona. It's not entirely true in the chromosphere. And it's, in many cases, not true by the time you get to the surface of the sun itself. Oh, um, you should disregard the, co the other colors. They basically, they, they basically show you the field lines that leave the, the model box. And if they leave the model box, of course, they have a bit of a problem. And depending on the model that you use, because they may be carrying currents, but the models don't know where to map these currents. So essentially, the part where, wherever the field is not white or red, we don't really know what it looks like, because it's doing something that we can't model properly. So we have to extend the model volume, which we can do as computers become ever more powerful. Uh, so we hope that we'll get there. But it really is the only way in which we can get energy out of the solar corona. Um, there's a table in 
Terry Forbes's uh, chapter in the second volume that's, that looks at the energy densities that are available, where you look at how much thermal energy or flow energy or gravitational energy is available, and they're all very, very much smaller than what sits in the field itself. So it's really the field itself that has to be tapped in order to create an explosion. Now, these explosions happen pretty dramatically. Often you can see structures that look like ropes exploding. Often you can see just distortions in the active region field as you go through the dynamics. Often they're very pretty, um, which is the nice thing about solar physics. We have lots of pretty pictures to show. It's making sense, quantitative sense out of these pictures that is really the difficulty. Um, I can't go through all of the details that we have to go through to explain why there are things like explosions. So I'm going to refer you to chapters by Terry Forbes and Hugh Hudson in the second volume. But the basics of it is this. First of all, you have to create an environment in which the field becomes unstable. You have to create an environment in which if you change one parameter gradually, the field has to respond at some point very quickly, dramatically, to change from one state to another. The second part to create the visible effects of the flare and the coronal mass ejection is you have to then tap the magnetic energy and create a conversion system in which you take that energy that was electromagnetic and convert it eventually into thermal energy. And the thermal energy can lead to the photons that we can actually detect. So it's a two-step thing. Um, one has to do, in this particular case, what they're doing is they have a rope electrical current running right through the room here, underneath an overlying arcade with opposite polarities here. And they say, what would happen if I drove these two polarities together? And sometimes on the sun, you can have converging flows, or you can have shearing flows where it happens like this. You bring these together, and they showed in this analytical model that what happens is that the corona responds for a while by just changing the structure. And in fact, as you bring these two points clo closer and closer together, you basically lower the point at which this flux rope sits. But interestingly, at that point, uh, there is a point in that uh, set of solutions where you can't lower it anymore. What it then does, it wants to go to another branch in the stability diagram, and the field would jump. Now, th this is an ideal state. It's two-dimensional. But it gives you the idea that, yes, you can have configurations of the magnetic field. That if you put in enough electrical current into a magnetic configuration, it cannot, if you grow that current, it cannot stay in that configuration by a smooth evolution. It has to transition rapidly from one state into another. It's only when you start allowing reconnection in this process, which in this particular case was not allowed, uh, that you can convert energy, that electrical energy, into something else. You can accelerate particles uh, that eventually may lead to thermalizations. And you can reconfigure the field and change its topology. You'll have to read through that um, in order to understand how this all happens. But all of the steps that are involved in this transformation make for a very complex patterns of signatures of a flare, that depending on the wavelength you look at a flare, you'll see something else. But they're all somehow related. If you look at the most energetic parts of the spectrum, so hard x-rays or radio, where you see signatures of non-thermal particle populations, uh, what you'll see is the process that immediately follows the acceleration of the particles. If you look at soft x-rays or the extreme ultraviolet, you're basically looking at what happens after that. These particles may get accelerated. The electrical currents are being dissipated. Both of those are being transformed into heat. And the heat forms a thermal emission that then uh, makes the corona glow. So if you look at hard x-rays uh, or radio wavelengths, you see pulsed emissions that, that show you that the reconnection processes are are intrinsically unstable, intermittent, happen on very short time scales. All of that population of, of particles and the currents dissipated get dumped into the thermal energy reservoir. And the thermal energy reservoir shows a much longer evolution pattern. And it shows a much ev longer evolution pattern because you can throw a a thermal energy into the corona very quickly uh, by having non-thermal particles. For example, one way of doing this you have particles impinge on the lower atmosphere. The lower atmosphere gets heated. If you heat the lower atmosphere, you raise the pressure scale height. So we basically start flowing material up into the corona, which makes it brighter. But once you've got it there, it can't just fall down. It has to lose its energy. It has to lose its energy either by conduction or by radiation. In fact, it happens in both ways. 
And those time scales are very much longer. So you can heat immediately and then glow and cool very much more slowly. So you get this fast rise, extended decay. Some stellar term, I think, is Fred. Uh, fast rise, extended decay in flares. And flares have an interesting property. They happen on all scales that we can observe. If we count the number of things we would call a flare as a function of their peak brightness or their total energy involved, what you get is almost always these power law distributions, where if you count the number versus how bright they are or how much energy they carry, uh, you get power laws, power laws that extend over, in this case, one, two, five, six orders of magnitude. And I'll show you just in a moment a diagram that goes even further than that. Now, another topic of research is what that is telling us. Um, it's telling us either something about the state of the corona itself, that because the magnetic field is being wound by the convective motions, it tends to evolve towards a state that is somehow equivalent to a sand pile uh, or an avalanche of a mountain, that any perturbation will lead to any magnitude of, uh, of perturbation that follows because of that. So you can have avalanches of any scale follow a, 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 perturba a small perturbation in the system. It is equally possible, and it's maybe more likely, that what it's actually telling us is that, the, that how energy gets into the atmosphere is something that knows about a fractal system, a, ma a many scale system, so that it's the dynamo that operates underneath the surface, because that in the end is what puts the energy into the atmosphere, that causes that state. There's a big debate raging on whether this is a coronal property or whether this is actually a dynamo property. So you'll have to stay tuned on that one. Um, this is a diagram that I re refer to on, on Saturday, and I'm going to talk temporarily only about the, the one on the right. What we try to do is say, well, how many of these brightenings do we have, for example, per year as a function of their energy? And there's lots of points that are in this diagram. And it's very difficult to create this diagram. And the reason why it's so difficult is that flares have their signatures at, in different ways. When we look at the very smallest ones, the ones that are, have to do, that basically happen just at the resolution, the energy resolution that we still have, or even the spatial resolution that we have on the sun, those typically are very faint brightenings in outside of active regions that happen primarily in the extreme ultraviolet. And they're so faint that different publications doing, using different methods of measuring them can disagree on their energy or on their frequency by, if you look at this, this is an order of magnitude, by an order of magnitude. So there's a great deal of uncertainty in counting these things and putting them on an energy scale. So these happen in the extreme ultraviolet. If you go towards the larger ones, they are most easily seen in the soft X-ray domain. So there's a diagram, part of a study from a soft X-ray flare. The largest of the flares typically happen in the X-rays or hard X-rays, and they happen up here. Now, I haven't just put these together from extreme ultraviolet to soft X-rays to harder X-rays. What we try to do is really convert them onto a common scale. And then you have to realize that if you look at a flare, say you look at an X-ray flare, people typically show you the X-ray flare or the extreme ultraviolet images because they're prettiest. But that's not where the energy is. The amount of energy that goes out, for example, in the GOES light curves, the GOES light curves that are used to classify flares from ABC MX uh, scale, contains typically less than 1% of the total energy, radiated energy, in a flare. Even with the AAA instrument on SDO, where we look at the extreme ultraviolet, if you add up all of the X-rays in the extreme ultraviolet, for, say, a typical M-class flare, a large but not extreme flare, you're looking at only about 30% of the total energy. The bulk of the energy seems to almost always come out in the visible. But in the visible, it comes out against this very bright photospheric background. So most people haven't mentioned this. It's only now that we have very sensitive in instruments uh, that look at visible wavelengths at high resolution and high signal to noise that we can actually begin to tell that most of the energy almost always comes out in the visible part anyway. Um, now this is an interesting power law distribution that just to give you a sense of scale, I just, we're, we're not very good at intuitions about large numbers. So 
Uh, I just put it in terms of energies of the first of the nuclear bombs that were used. The, the very smallest that we can use on the, measure on the sun is a couple of thousands of these nuclear bombs going off at the same time. A large X-class flare, the kind of flare that Sten Odenwald was talking about is what might be triggering major space weather consequences in our technological infrastructure. You're talking about something like 100 billion nuclear bombs going off at the same time. So it's really only the distance there that's, that saves us. For stars, if we look at a young star, it goes up by another three to four orders of magnitude. And this is one of the great puzzles of the present day. What, what does the sun do in this domain? Is it really curving down like that distribution is suggesting? Or can the sun actually do what a young star can still do and throw at us something that's 10,000 times stronger? We don't know from anything near first principles or modeling of a dynamo or modeling of a, of a coronal magnetic field instability how to deal with that. So all of that information has to come from observations. Um, I'm not going to worry you unnecessarily. I would say that we have enough evidence that this thing actually does curve down, that somehow an old star can't do these really bad things anymore. That still leaves us with about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight orders of magnitude in energy, for which there's not a bad approximation here in the form of a continuation. And it'd be really interesting to fill up these gaps and get the uncertainties out and understand whether the sun's magnetic field actually really is this cascade of scales from the very smallest to the very largest. Now, one other thing I want to mention, because it's kind of at the forefront of what we're trying to understand now, is this. Here's a, a movie of a flare, an, an M-class flare, and an eruption at the limb. And in these images, these intensity images, you don't see terribly much happening. But these instruments nowadays are so sensitive that what we can actually do is just look at where things change. So the, the, the movie on the right-hand side is actually showing you the difference between two successive images. So it focuses entirely on what changed. And we show it in the same way. We package information here into three, the, the red, green, and blue channels going from 2 million to 1.5 million to 1 million. And we can package that running difference movie, of course, also in this color scale. So then what you're seeing is this big volume expands here, and it goes blue, is it's cooling. That part we actually understand. This huge volume is expanding. It's just adiabatic cooling. There's bound to be residual heating in that process, too, but there's just cooling going on. And there's a front propagating away from it where you can see red, yellow, um, you have to go through these color combinations to think in three colors, and we're still learning how to do that, which shows that that front is actually a warm front. It's a heat front that travels across the sun. What I want to point out to you is what happens here. This front is traveling across most of the sun, and as it reaches this point, another destabilization happens. So until now, we've been thinking about flares and eruptions as local phenomena. Something here becomes unstable and goes off. We're seeing more and more evidence that many of these destabilizations are actually driven at a distance. We can just see the signal go from one place to another. Just to give you another example of that, here's a, a filament eruption. And look at what happens here. You can see the field being stretched out. And it forms this explosion, a flare, in a region that's about a solar radius, 500 to 700,000 kilometers away. Now, it means that both of these regions have to be near an unstable state, because you have to have energy enough for it to go unstable there. But the reason it goes unstable now becomes a point of study. It's either because you're changing the amount of energy that sits in this region by adding to the electrical currents in that region itself, driving it across the threshold, or you're changing the surrounding field either because it's gradually changing, because everything is changing, or as in this case, because you're literally stretching it like taffy, changing the surrounding field conditions, leading to an instability somewhere else. This is great complexity for space weather forecasters. Um, here's another one. It doesn't have to be limited to, to active regions. These decayed active regions that form these large patterns of dominant one polarity next to a dominant opposite polarity uh, form arcades within often flux ropes drift. We call those things uh, filaments or prominences, depending on how you see them. 
here's an eruption of such a prominence. What's happened is you've driven out this flux rope. The field underneath it reforms. It begins to glow at the extreme ultraviolet wavelengths. Um, and the amount of energy in this is actually, in many cases, comparable to that of a large flare. We just didn't know that because we didn't have the instrumentation to measure it. But now we do. But look at what happens here. If you can look at two places at the same time, there's an eruption here, and there's an eruption up there. They happen at the same time. If you can look at three places at the same time, there's another one down here that also happens at the same time. Now, things happening at the same time doesn't necessarily mean that they're connected. So one thing we do is we collect statistics. This happens too often to be random. The second is you try to model it. Now, modeling a system the size of the sun is a really tall order. Um, some groups are trying to do this. Often what one does is one simplifies it uh, into studying something else. I'm going to skip this, uh, if I could. And the two ways of doing this is you can do this either in this potential field approximation or in an MHD approximation. I'm going to show you both. In the MHD approximation, what we've, in the, the potential field approximation, what I've done here is, is this. When the sun, um, how do I explain that one? Uh, the sun is a rotating body. We only know about its magnetic field when we can measure it, so on the front side. We don't know what happens on the back. But at some point, the back comes back to the front. So what we noticed in this particular instance for these August 1st, 2010 events was that as this region came back onto the surface, onto the visible hemisphere, there was a substantial amount of new magnetic flux that had emerged. Two entirely new active region and one active region that had rejuvenated, that had a lot of extra magnetic field in it. And we asked ourselves the question, what if we took this full sphere magnetic field approximation and went in time from what we knew when it rotated off to the backside to what we will know a week later when it rotates onto the front and just make a little time machine to sweep back and forth between those two states. This is not a real physical change in the plasma. What it shows you is where things must have changed in order to get from the old state to the new state. And all of those things happen across, if you look at this, there's a series of magnetic null points, there's a series of arcades, and all these field lines essentially are going across, I guess, what you could call a magnetic quake fault zone, um, a separatrix domain, a, a topological separator where field on one side goes towards one side and field on the other goes towards the other side. All of that change is focused on that separator domain. Now, if you put underneath this what happened on the sun properly, what you'll see is this. Remember that, that divide here. The, the, initially, the activity starts on this divide here. Then this filament goes unstable on the divide, and the active region goes unstable. But once these two are have it destabilized, this one gets unhappy. So now this one, also on this divide, begins to go unstable. And now you have to look all the way across here where the field went, that these two actually go together. So this is beginning to demonstrate that the sun is functioning as a coupled system. We have a lot of research work to do to, to really demonstrate that it does that. One other aspect is, as I said, you do it in an MHD approximation. And in an MHD approximation, you have to make lots of approximations. So in this case, the group at Predictive Sciences uh, in San Diego put three flux ropes next to each other. And they basically asked, what if we drove this one to become unstable by shearing the field here? And it goes unstable. What you see is that its destabilization causes the other two that are near to their stability limit to also go. So now we have more than just hand waving. We have evidence here that the sun can destabilize in one region because of something happening in another region. The next step is to do this for the actual field configuration I just showed you. That's a tough one, because there you have to, to model a very large part of the sun and the solar corona well out into the heliosphere to make that happen. Our colleagues are trying to do this. I would urge you to remember that date, August 1st of 2010, because of this. Um, it was such a well-observed set of events that there's a whole sequence of papers coming out on this now. 
uh, starting with our initial study at the top where we said, this is interesting. All these things are connected and happening at the same time. We looked at it with instruments that were stereo uh, spacecraft looking at it from the side, SDO from the front. After that, there's a series of papers that actually combine it with observations at different distances within the heliosphere. Uh, stereo and SDO are all at one astronomical unit. They're basically in Earth orbit, although at different positions. But there were also spacecraft near Venus, Venus Express, and near uh, Mercury, the Mercury Messenger, that saw the propagation of these perturbations. And not only were they measuring at different distances, they were also measuring it at a separation angle, spread angle, of about 120 degrees into the heliosphere. So there's that whole series of papers that basically take you from a set of events on the sun to interactions of coronal mass ejections in the heliosphere and to the point that they actually start hitting geospace and causing perturbations. And there'll be more there. So follow that trail if you wish to, uh, to understand what happens in the heliosphere, too. Thank you. Questions? asking about the, the interpretation of the roll-off of the power law spectrum or the apparent power law spectrum of flare energies. Um, there are at least two parts to that answer. Um, three parts, I guess. The roll-off happens in the domain of the most, ex most unusual flares. Um, there's a handful, well, two hands full. There's about a dozen flares that really sit on that slope that seem to be going down in the past 30 years. That's, that's not a very good statistic. Most of those haven't been observed very well in the sense that only two, three of them, we've had instruments looking well enough that we could actually really measure their total amount of energy involved. For the others, you have to guess at the total amount of energy because we see them in one wavelength, but we don't really know how the energy is partitioned. So just how fast and at what point that roll-off happens is still subject to further study. The reason why it's happening, um, I would speculate right now, has to do with the fact that that's about the largest active region that the sun can put out from its dynamo. Um, they happen on the regions with the largest amounts of flux and embedded within them the largest sunspots. Again, we don't have too much statistics on it. But we can go back four centuries of sunspot observations that have been recorded. There aren't any that are significantly bigger than those large ones in the largest flares that we've seen in the last decade. So at least for the last 400 years, you could say the sun has never put active regions on the surface that are large enough to power something larger. All of that is uh, talking about approximate cause. The ultimate cause, we don't know. Uh, something in the dynamo appears to limit how large of a bundle of magnetic flux can come to the surface. And that apparently decreases with the spin rate of the star. That as the star slows down, it doesn't generate these really large structures anymore. Why that happens is a matter of dynamo modeling, of which we really don't have one. We don't, I mean, we have dynamo models in the sense that we are experimenting with coupling of processes. We don't have a dynamo model in the sense even of knowing why the sun is on average as active as it is, or why the sun generates these types of active regions that it does. So there's a lot, a lot of research to be done there. But there we're really on the side of the observational frontier, and even that is pretty tenuous. I mean, okay. On the small side of that flare spectrum, we disappear into the thermal energy reservoir. They, they become so small that the, uh, that the amount of emission that we have to detect them against becomes the dominant component. So it, it be, there's no reason to think. In fact, there's lots of reasons to think why ever smaller flares do occur. Uh, but at some point, they become so, clear, so small that we don't have the observational capabilities anymore. 
to measure them. We are increasing our observational capabilities. It's a matter of signal, signal to noise. We can probably push it a bit further. But at some point, you really get into there's just too much background radiation to measure them properly. Amitabha? So, so you're, you're pointing out that we don't really know how to interpret um, that spectrum of flare releases. I'd say it's probably even more complicated than that we don't have a coherent model for that entire range. It may be that that entire range isn't really an entire range. It's puzzling that they seem to align these different sets of observations into something that forms an apparent continuation on a double logarithmic <laughs> representation. Um, but we also know that we're looking at different beats. When we're looking at large flares, we're looking at active regions. When we're looking at these small extreme ultraviolet brightenings in the quiet sun, we're looking at all these very small magnetic configurations that are flaring. Now, in a sense, um, we could convince ourselves they look the same. They're just more or less energy density in these fields. So their appearances as they, as they come to us in observables will shift. But we have to bear in mind that the other thing I said was these ephemeral regions seem to exist all the time. They don't couple to a cycle. So there's a dynamo that is cycling on an 11-year on sunspot cycle or a 22-year magnetic cycle. These, ef these small ephemeral regions and the regions that are now only becoming visible by the highest resolution observations, like we have them from spacecraft, like the Hinode spacecraft, don't show a cycle signature. So it's either a different process or the process of the dynamo has different scales to it, one that is global and cycles, and one that is more local and does not cycle. It's hard to imagine those two processes happening independently. It's a field is a coupled system. But what drives it and what the ingredients are of the very deep-seated global dynamo and the very, probably very near-surface processes that drive these ephemeral regions mean that there's, there's another process that folds into, into understanding that continuation. That you have to allow for the fact that there may be a bend in it or a kink in it just because you go from one dominant process to another dominant process. Anyway, lots of research to be done. Professor Longcoat. to summarize that question. <laughs> it's about energy budgets in the different domains, the different thermal and physical domains in the solar atmosphere, where you're basically asking, Am I, are we assuming that they always vary more or less in step? If brightening happens in one, does a brightening happen in the other? The answer to that is we already know that that's not the case. Uh, we know it by just looking, in my case, we look at AAA data a lot. We, s we very frequently will see a flare and an eruption, an associated eruption of the field that leads to a brightening at one wavelength and a dimming at another wavelength. This is part of the discussion, I think, that's going on about the, the origin and the processes that uh, s sit at the very beginning of what becomes a coronal mass ejection, where there are coronal dimmings and coronal brightenings, and um, it depends on the wavelength you're looking at it. So yes, there is a, 
I think in general, as the process happens, different domains in the atmosphere respond differently. All I meant to say was that if you're looking at the x-rays, just because the images are high contrast and they're pretty, that doesn't mean that you're looking at where the bulk of the energy is coming from eventually. All right, my clock says it's time for coffee. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.